Any other prayer requests? No other prayer requests? Let's just pray that that guy comes through and moves that shed tomorrow. And then, um, man, but Joe and the boys will get it all with the rest of it moved. Amen. Get ready to get out of here. Sunday's our last service in this building. All right, let's, uh, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Mighty God and Savior, we thank you. We praise you. We ask you, Lord God, to do great and mighty things. We pray right now, first and foremost, for comfort for those families that lost their children. And we pray, oh God, that you would uh, push back the forces of darkness and the forces of evil in this world, Lord. And we ask you, Lord God, to strengthen the church and let the church shine in this day and age that we live. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for protecting us and watching over us and keeping us. And we thank you, mighty God, for this opportunity to study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Oh, that was weak. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. That's better. That's better. <clears throat> I wonder if we could sing Amazing Grace a cappella style. We'll give Nikki and uh, Jimmy a break tonight. So if someone wants to start us off, help us here. Help me because you know I'm rough. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. sing and you worship and you praise God, how it just like pushes all the other stuff away. Amen. Praise God. All right. Um, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 8 through 10. Chapter 2 and verses 8 through 10. Everybody's staying here tonight because uh, the other building is full of stuff from the shed and we're going to have uh, a lesson in tonight, here tonight. Last Wednesday night, we, we talked about holiness. Tonight, more holiness. But this tonight, we're going to focus on holiness uh, for the men. Ladies can say a silent, quiet amen. <laughs> we don't want the ladies to get too excited because they're next. Um, chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. Someone read that for us. First Timothy, chapter 2, 8 through 10. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shame, facedness, and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. All right. So, verse 9 and 10, we're not going to focus on that tonight. We're going to focus on verse 8. And breaking that down a little bit, okay? Um, so, you may be seated. Um, Brother Cheyenne, would you get a piece of paper and a pen? I want you to pass this around to all the, uh, the adults of each family member. And um, I'm going to need your email address to send you your lesson for next Wednesday. All right? For the next six weeks, I will send you your lesson for Wednesday. Because we're going to go to small groups. Okay? If you want to combine with people in your area, sure, that's fine. Do that. So, like, you know, if... Uh, Ashley wants to get together with Nikki, you can do that. If uh, Brother Mike, you want to get with the Congroves, 
Sister Hermes and I went in town, and I'm saying this because we're supposed to go out of town this next week. We may not. If we don't, we'll go to one of the groups, okay? Um, and then each week that we're in town, we'll rotate amongst the groups and go to each group, okay? Doesn't mean we're going to teach. Somebody in that family group can teach. I will send you the, there's a, a, a book that you can go by week by week, and then there's a video. So basically you'll play the video, and then you'll discuss some questions. It's not real intense, it's not, it's, it's actually a thought-provoking small group study done by um, Pastor Ken Gurley, and uh, so I watched the first video, it's very good, um, and I think we'll enjoy going through this together as a church, even though we're separate. It may cause us more to be more, uh, to study more individually, okay? So if you don't do a small group family prayer at your house, and or you don't do family prayer, that's fine, but we will start doing it on Wednesdays throughout the entire summer. Now, with our moving, the new church is charging us a set fee for Sundays only. Now, if we add a day, they said that it will increase a little bit, okay? So I don't think we'll increase that much, but you know they have to turn off all the lights and the air, and they have to shut the sound, the uh, what do you call stuff off the the, uh, the the security system. So you know, of course, they're going to want a little bit more, all right? Now they're not charging us a lot, but I will tell you this: that doesn't mean that we need to slack on tithes and offering, right? Because whatever we don't use is going in a savings. We're going to chunk away as much as we possibly can. While we look for another building or another opportunity. Brother Mike said he's seen some places, churches that looked like they were abandoned, didn't know if they were having service there. There might be something out that we can get. But until we find it, we're going to have church down the street. They've been very, very, um, uh, how do I want to put it, Hospi hospitable, very nice. And when you go in their church, it's an upgrade from where you're at right now. A major upgrade. Okay. Major upgrade. Matter of fact, their drums, yeah. drummers, are not electric. Yeah. These are drum pit. They have a keyboard. I wouldn't say it's any better than ours because they have a nice keyboard uh, there. And um, they even offered to let us use their 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 guitar. So our guitar guy, he's, he's got his own stuff. So he just like playing people's equipment. So uh, that's how hospitable they are, right? We will have to clean it when we leave. We'll have to leave it clean. There were some specific guidelines that, uh, you know, of how to, to do things and uh, ladies, you know, that sort of thing. But we'll talk about that later. Um, of course, ladies, you all should understand. And I'm going to put you in. Make sure that you ladies, make sure that the ladies take care of lady stuff where it appropriately goes. Right? All diapers, out. No diapers left in the trash air. Everything it's got to go. Feminine products, got to go. Nothing goes in the trash. Nothing stays in the toilet. It all has to go to the trash. So um, other than that, they didn't give us a whole lot of other insight. But as we go, I'm sure they will. Um, we do have two classes. So we'll have one for the teens and one for the little ones. They're already decorated. Your key is to make sure they don't get messed up. So we're going to have to treat that place better than we treat our own. That means you little kids... You can't be pulling stuff off the walls. You can't be throwing stuff on the floor. There will be no food and drink in the sanctuary. There will be no playing on the altar. Because they said they want to keep their altar uh, holy. And that they want to make sure that it's kept a certain way. And that so we need to treat their altar holy. So children, you're not going to be allowed to play on the altar. The only ones going on the altar is the keyboard player, the drummer, the, the lead singer, whoever's leading a song, and our, our, our other musicians. That's it. Don't be playing up there. However, they do believe in dancing in the spirit in their church. So, of course, you know, we can worship to our fullest. So, I think it's going to be um, a little different transition than we're used to, but I think it'll, it'll benefit us very much. They also want to have a Spanish-English service with us. And their pastor's son said he would like to come to one of our services as well. So, with all that said, let's get into tonight's lesson. Uh, holiness for men. Richie, would you go get me a bottle of water, please? Uh, holiness for men. So we're going to deal with three primary areas that are specific to men. Young men, old men, 
middle-aged men, little men, all men. Okay? See if you only believe in two genders here. There's only two people we're talking to. Either the guys or the girls, one or the other, right? There's only two. Amen. I don't care if Facebook shuts me down over that comment. There's only two genders. Amen. Period. Amen. Amen. True biblical holiness has two components. Separation from the world and dedication to God. Most people think holiness, oh, separation, I can't do this and I can't do that. No, 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 no. Dedication to God. It's more dedication to God, which is the most important part. And if you're dedicated to God, then your separation isn't a hard problem. But if you're not dedicated to God, then your separation from the world is a problem. Amen? Yeah. All right, don't y'all go to sleep to me on me tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 and then we're going to go um, 17 to 18, and then chapter 7, 1. I guess 1 through. I'm just going to read. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, that description right there, that, that scripture right there, 2 Corinthians 6, and then also 2 Corinthians 7 and 1, is not just for men. That's for everybody. By definition, holiness involves both the inner man and outer man by evidence. 1 Corinthians 6 and 19 and 20. What? Know ye not? That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. All right? I need to remember that. Next time a student asks me why I don't have holes all poked in my body and why I'm not drawing on my body like, like uh, somebody with a marker. I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. You were purchased with a price. The price of Christ. The body of the blood of Jesus purchased you. Amen. Inward holiness will produce outward holiness, but outward holiness is worthless without an inward reality. Holiness includes attitudes and thoughts. This is particularly to men. Now, in the day and age that we live, women um, are quickly uh, falling into the porn trap as well. Matthew 5 and 27 through 28. Did you get that? Matthew 5, 27, 28. Ye have heard that said of them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her in his heart. Notice uh, the scripture speaks of a attire of a harlot, but never the attire of a whoremonger. A whoremonger is the opposite, it's the male version. Right? It's a guy that's so overwhelmed with sex thoughts and with sex that he's considered a whoremonger. In our day and age, a harlot or a whore or a woman that gives herself to many men is looked down upon. But a guy that has multiple sexual partners is a hero. Right? That is not God's word. That's the, that's the culture of today. It is not, um, it's not good for men to be that way. Now, men can't sin in the way they dress because outward holiness is not their primary problem area, right? Look at any church that's relaxed their standards on outward holiness and know which sex is most affected. The women. The men could begin wearing immodest clothing and loads of jewelry and start letting their hair grow long. But in general, they never get involved in, the same, in this to the same context as women do. Notice, Jesus never said, whoso looketh on a man to lust. Now, do women go to Las Vegas and go watch the Chippendale show? Yeah, they do. Do women go to male strip clubs? Yeah, they do. 
And I'm just being straight on it. My, my grandkids are hearing this. So you, your kids are going to hear real teaching tonight. Even though Satan has amped up sexuality in this world, and yes, sometimes women do fall into this trap of lust of the eyes, but men fall in it more and quicker. Christian men generally don't mind holiness teaching because they think it doesn't really affect them. Because we're always talking about how a woman looks and what she needs to wear and what she doesn't need to wear and this and that and the other thing. And that's another whole Bible study, by the way. And, it, and we'll get to it at some point. But I will tell you this, that um, men's dress hasn't changed much, right? The only thing I think in men's dress that we have done is we've, we've dressed down a little bit. You know, I remember the days when, you know, you had to wear a white shirt. When I went to Calvary Tabernacle and I got up there on the platform and I had a colored shirt on and a tie and a suit. And, they, and, they, and one brother said, hey, Brother Wolf didn't tell you, he didn't put you in the office to tell you that you only wear white shirts on the platform? I'm like, no. And I'm not changing because you said it. And now, then you have a tie and a jacket on tonight, right? Well, I guess we, have, we have lowered some things like that. But nobody is lusting after me because I've got jeans on and my brand new Vans that one of my students bought me for graduation. There are guys that also wear the skin tight too. They do. They wear skin tight things. That's right. Like men will walk around with just the spandex pants on. And yeah, it's not, it's not attractive. We're not going to get on that spandex thing tonight, okay? You forget I work in the public school system, okay? And they push that stuff to the max. Both in men and women are to exemplify holiness to those around them. God's holy people will stand out. Apostolic women generally stand out by their appearance. Apostolic men generally stand out by their attitude. Their actions, how they act. Men, God will help us, but he's not going to force us. Like women and like men are also, we must make a choice to live by God's standards. Look, after studying this, I'm glad to put on a shirt and button it to the top. Put my sleeves on because it's a whole lot easier for me to deal with. I have no problem not wearing shorts in Florida. I'm like, you don't wear shorts? No, I hardly ever wear shorts. It's not a problem. To me, right? Because it's not a holiness issue for me. What's a holiness issue are three problem areas we're going to talk about. Number one, guys, appetite. What's the first thing you thought of when I said appetite, Richie? Food, right? Oh, well, what's food? Food's one of them. There are the appetites. Food appetites. You know, it's one of the things we don't preach about in, in Pentecost is gluttony. We don't preach about it because we like it. Can you tell? I mean, I, I lost that thing. Now I, can't, I found it again. I'm sad I found that thing. I was starting to look good. Now I got that. Now I got that. Got that dad bought again. I need to get rid of that. So we're plagued. Ever since Adam's failure, men have been plagued with out-of-control appetites or lusts, let's call it what it is, within our own bodies that war against holiness. Appetites, however, are God-given. God gave us this, right? He gave us appetites. He gave us emotions. He gave us everything that we are. Now, appetite for food is both natural and necessary. But an unrestrained appetite in this area will lead to obesity and health problems, right? Men, God will not remove your appetites. For this would do irreparable damage to our masculinity. He does not expect, what he does expect us to do is to control our appetites. I'm going to explain Men have a drive to conquer, right? It's okay to have a drive to conquer. You need to have that drive to conquer. You need to set some goals in your life. Have a drive to, I'm going to be the best on the job. I'm going to be the fastest on the team, right? That's a good thing. You can do that, right? You have some drive in your life to advance your career, provide a nice home, and a secure lifestyle for your family. That's appetite controlled. 
right? I think Brother Joe and I have done that. I think we've been successful, right? Brother Brandon, he's, he's doing the best he can right now, right? Brother Mike's done that in his lifetime. That's a controlled drive to conquer. Now, here's an uncontrolled drive to conquer. Becomes a workaholic and sacrifices his family and spiritual life for his career. Young men, hear me and hear me well. You will never advance yourself farther than where God can advance you. You can work the hours. You can sacrifice the family. You can give everything up and so for work and for money and for career. But you'll never sacrifice enough to go farther than where God will promote you. I have seen it. I have seen people that they sacrificed everything. They never came to family functions. They were always working. They were always doing this. It was always about the money. And guess what? They lost everything. Don't lose your spiritual life and don't lose your family. Remember those priorities. God, then family, then career. Don't get them out of, out of order. God, family, career. Say it with me. God, family, career. Keep those in order or you're going to get out of order. Because what happens is God slips from number one and career will jump up there and take over. We have to be careful. That becomes an uncontrolled appetite. It's good to want nice things. It's okay to have to want a nice truck. It's okay to want to have a nice house. There's nothing wrong with that. But if that is your sole motivation and drive, and you're taking God out of where he is, number one in priorities, you have an uncontrolled appetite. The next one is a drive to compete. Well, a drive to compete. It's a natural thing. We, we're always competing, right? I know, I know even like when we play wiffle ball, right? Sister Barbie hates to be on the loser team, and uh, I hate to be on the loser team. Well, there's a lot of competitiveness. However, our competitiveness is not uh, a bad thing unless we let it get out of control. It's control. It's fun. We poke and play. But when it's no longer uh, play and no longer fun and jokes and games, and it becomes angry and jealous and revengeful, then it's uncontrolled. So when your drive to compete becomes angry, jealous, and revengeful against those who perceives to be ahead of them, now your appetite has become out of control. Um, Ramirez boys playing and fussing and fighting all the time. Your appetite is out of control. You need to get it under control. Congo boys, same thing. Avery, Elias, same thing. Rain same thing. Rain boys, you yeah, Colton, you too. We're going to train them up right from the beginning. When you become angry and jealous and revengeful against you, those that are ahead of you, you've got an appetite that's out of control. And you need to get it in control. You know how to get it in control. We'll tell you about that later. Here's another one. A drive to control. Take charge of situations. Step into leadership roles for the benefit of others. Okay? That's natural. We should want to be leaders. God put that in us to be leaders. Sometimes we don't lead enough. We need to lead. God put that in there. As long as it benefits somebody else. But when you become, when you manipulate people and situations and you use your influence for yourself, that's an uncontrolled appetite. I lead the church for the church. If I led the church just so that I could be seen uh, popular or so I could be known in the district as a pastor, that's the wrong way. That's the wrong reason for leadership. Because when you lead for yourself and not for the benefit of others, you're not a good leader. And you won't treat your people right. Now the next one. If your this appetite is controlled, you will become physically attracted to a woman leading to marriage 
in a faithful sexual relationship with her only. Her only. That's if your sex drive is under control. When your sex drive, guys, is not controlled, you become promiscuous, seeking selfish sexual gratification with no regard to God's commands. So you will go find the whore. You will go find a promiscuous woman. You will go find pornography. You will go find homosexuality. Actually, it might come looking for you. That is if your sexual part of you is not under control. Today, in the day and age that we live, Richie, you're getting ready to go to high school. You guys have done, you've done high school and you're in high school. And you know what I'm talking about. We caught some kids having sex in this parking lot during lunch. Now, the video I saw was just him on top of her kissing. They were fully dressed. But that's not what the students said because they said, well, that's all that was videotaped. But I walked by there another day and they were going to it. Uncontrolled. Uncontrolled. So I know the push for sex is high in high school. You got to control your body. You got to control your eyes. You got to control your mind. Is it a battle? Absolutely. Absolutely. But we have to do it. The Bible has much to say about our appetites. You remember when I first started this and I said the first part of the scripture was just for the was for the guys and the second was for the women? I will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands. Now you're thinking these hands. No. Your appetite. Without wrath, that's your anger. And without doubting, that is your apathy. Remember that. All right, we're going to move on here. I'm almost done with appetite. Got two more to go. It's going to be a long night, huh? The Bible has much to say about our appetite, especially those get out of control lusts, for they destroy our spiritual life. Remember that lust is not just a wrong sexual appetite, but any wrong appetite. You can, you can lust after candy and snacks all the time, Avery. Snacks. I want snacks. Snacks. Bad. Snacks all the time is bad. The wrong appetite. You can't live on snacks. You can't live on candy. You can't live on promiscuous sex. You won't be healthy, both physically and mentally. All right? 1 Peter 2 and 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing to this world, and it is certain we can bring nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, now people get this scripture all messed up. For the love of money is the root of all evil. People say money is evil. No, money is not evil. The love of money is evil. Which while some coveted after them erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many Sorrows. Since appetites that can cause lust cannot be removed from our lives, the only one way we can deal with it is it's got to be subdued with something stronger than it. Go check that joke. To subdue something strong, something else must be stronger. If you can't control your appetites, then you've got to get something stronger to control it. Listen, your flesh will, it will, what do they call that um, when you when you, you mess around, with, not cheat on somebody, but you, your, your, your flesh will sell you short. It will. Okay? You can't trust yourself, your flesh, to, to hold back appetites. Because your flesh loves the appetites. It loves 
it loves sexual pleasure. Your flesh loves it. But there's a time and a place and a certain relationship where that is supposed to be. When you take it out of that context of that holy, committed uh, relationship, then it's just all over the place. And you open yourself up to a multitude of things other than just sin. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after them, erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many arrows. We say, oh, the devil, the devil. No, you, you pierced yourself through when you made the decision to go mess around with all these people. The Bible says when you're married, the two, the twain, become one flesh. So that God did not design you to go connecting to all kinds of people all over the world. Because you're connecting your mind, body, and spirit to somebody else. That's not the way God established it. And that's not what he wants. Romans 6, 12 through 13. Get that? Romans 6, 12 through 13. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. I mean, that's pretty plain, right? Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Your body, a temple of the Holy Ghost, needs to be yielded unto God. We yield our bodies to everything else. We yield to our appetites. We yield to what we friends want. We yield to what this one wants. We yield to that pressure. We yield to that pressure. When if we would yield unto God and give ourselves totally unto God, then we wouldn't have to worry about yielding to that, that lust and that, that lust and that, this lust and that thing. God will provide you what you need. But when you go out and get your own, that's when you have problems. Galatians 5, 16 and 7. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, so that ye cannot do the things ye would. Man. How many blessings did we miss out on? How many times that God wanted to speak to us, but we didn't? We were doing this, and we shouldn't have been doing that. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. Somebody get that read for me, please. Righteousness and true holiness. Remember the other scripture in uh, Romans chapter 2? Be ye therefore transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? Remember I said that when you renew your mind, you pray through? Hey, wake up over there. Can't sleep in class. Can't sleep in here. Okay, just check it. Romans 13 and 14. Now put ye on... The Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision of the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Lust is a process. It always ends in death. Most men make the mistake of thinking they can handle the wrong things that they're tempted to look at, talk about, think about. They think this will never affect me, it will never show up in my actions. What they don't realize is that the process has already begun. And if it goes too far, they will be powerless to stop it. Furthermore, God already has a problem with it in their thoughts. Therefore, before it's even seen in their actions. Men, we cannot have holy hands without a holy heart. James 1, 14 and 15. But every man is tempted, wherein he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Look, the enemy knows what, how to entice.
appetize you. He knows what your appetites are. He knows he can't tempt you with something that you're not enticed by. I've used the, the story before of, you know, you can't entice somebody with uh, beets. Because most people don't like beets. They're like, ooh, that's gross. I hate beets, right? You can't, you can't say, well, I never dare go up there. You know, you, no problem. You ain't got to dare me to eat beets. I ain't going to eat beets, right? But if I put a piece of candy in front of you and say, hey, some candy right there. Don't you eat it. You'd be like, oh, the candy. I want the candy. I'm going to get the candy. I'm going to steal mama's snacks. I'm going to steal it. Oh, I, 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 yeah, that's dad's favorite drink. Okay, I'm going to drink it. I want it. And you give into it. You know it's wrong. You know it, mom and dad said, don't touch my stuff. <laughs> Proverbs 23 and 7. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if you think yourself, if you think yourself a winner, you can be a winner. If you think yourself a loser, you can be a loser too. If you think yourself holy, you can be holy. You can say, I can think I'm not going to do that. I can, I'm not going to do that. Sometimes you got to remove that appetite from your presence. If you have a problem with looking at certain things on the phone, you got to get off those things. If certain things are distracting from your spiritual man, I got to give my son-in-law recognition of props. He's not on Facebook or Instagram. He, he deleted the accounts. Matter of fact, they took like a month to even acknowledge that he wanted, that, are you sure you want to get rid of your account? They, they enticed him a couple of, are you sure? Now, I'm not saying he was looking at anything bad on there, don't get me wrong. But he was saying that was a distraction from his walk with God. And so if it's a distraction from your walk with God, you got to get rid of it. Number two problem area. I thought it was going to be a long night. <laughs> Anger. Woo. i tell you what. We define manhood by his ability to control one's emotions. This has got us in trouble, and we know it. Oh, yeah. You'll hold back the tears in a church service. You can handle that emotion. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. But, yeah, you can handle that one. Oh, I'm not going to. I don't care if they don't like me. I'm not upset about it. I'm tough. I can handle it. But anger, that's a hard one to control. But it rises up in you. And sometimes when it rises up in you, it's almost like an adrenaline rush. And you're just like, I want to do something. I tell you what, I wanted to choke that dog of my wife and Cheyenne's dog. I, wanted, I, I literally wanted to choke him. I felt the anger raise up in my body. I could feel it. It was like power. But I had to control it. So I had to say, that dog doesn't come in my house no more. And Sparky got sent out for a few days. Now he's, he came back in today. He's behaving himself. He's okay. But I was so mad then. I, I, I remember I couldn't let it go because if I had lost control and said bad words, or if I had said I'm going to get rid of that dog, then I would have had to live up to that word. When you don't control your anger, you say things and you do things that you regret. I didn't regret putting Sparky on restriction. I still don't regret putting Sparky on restriction, but he's so dumb and lovable, and he just always wants uh, uh, It's kind of hard to stay mad at him. He is. He's the most lovable one, I tell you. So it's hard to stay aggravated that he cheats him and my dog shoot three blinds. Actually, it's her dog when he's bad. He's good. My dog when he's good. He's like that meter claiming it. Man, you know what I'm talking about. Guys, you know what I'm talking about. You get so mad. It just boils up. And if you don't control it, it'll explode. I, you can't get rid of anger. Okay? You can, you can keep, you got to learn to control it. You can keep it calm. And the Holy Ghost will help you. But if you're weak in prayer and you're weak in fasting, it's hard to control your anger. And you will say things and do things that you regret. I'm speaking from experience, guys, okay? I've been in this thing for a little while, you know, and have I said some things I regretted through anger? Absolutely. And when you get older and you have relationships and you get mad, you're going to say some things you regret if you don't control it. 
Now, can you go back and apologize? Yes. But you know what? After you apologize so many times for the same thing, people stop accepting your apology. And they start saying, no, you're not talking to me like that anymore. In 1987, there was a study that identified the most stress-producing situations for men. In areas that they perceive themselves physically inadequate, emotionally expressive, subordinate to women, intellectually inferior, or performing inadequately. Those are stressful areas, according to that study. But men generally will not talk about it. Uninformed men tend to look at some coping strategies like talking to someone else about their venerable feelings is feminine. You gotta talk to somebody about your feelings, okay? You have them. God created them in you, you got them. You have to be able to talk to somebody. You will explode. You will have a heart attack. You have to be able to express your feelings. I'm still not 100% good at that either, okay? I'll be honest, be transparent with you guys. Over here and over here. I still haven't really grieved my mom. My wife knows it. I'll get a little teary. I said, you let it out. You just get a good cry right now. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. I'm telling you a fault, okay, to help you, to develop you, so that when you get older, you you know that there's somebody you can go to and, 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 and share your emotions. You're not going to get rid of them. And you're not, you're not, Weak and less of a man for sharing your emotions and getting it off and getting that off your chest before you explode. Anger is simply a strong emotion of displeasure arising from a feeling of injury. My blinds were injured and I was upset. Now, my pocket was upset. You can't have anything nice as long as you got kids and animals living in the house. It's a fact. <laughs> and even when they don't live in you and you just paint your wall and they draw on the wall, Avery, it's still there, isn't it? You never painted over it, did you? All that work I did in the house. I should leave my kids drawing in my bedroom on the wall. Let's hope we paint it for them. Anger is not sinful in and of itself. For the Bible tells us that God can become angry and even gives us to be permission to be angry without sinning. That's the catch. That's the catch 22. Anger and sin not. Oh, God, God really? I can't punch him. Pastor Mitchell said, yeah, punch him in the throat and say, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Slap him and say, in Jesus' name, right? So, so that's what was wrong with, with Chris Rock. I slapped him and say, in Jesus' name, huh? <laughs> Everybody got upset about that little slap. Man, if he'd have said something about my wife like that, he'd have had more than a slap. Then I had to really apologize, right? Man, I had to get banned from the Oscars for 10 years? Wow. <laughs> Ephesians 4 and 26. Be angry and sin not, and let not the sun go down on your wrath. If you are so angry at your brother or sister or uh, parent, that's right. You get. I know your kids get mad at your parents. My kids have been mad at me. They still get mad at me. <laughs> let's be. Let's be truthful here. Right, Cyan? <laughs> anger is sin. Not. However, anger is sinful when it explodes quickly without time to think rationally. When the injury that caught that causes it is only imagined and not real. What do you mean there? I'm going to explain it to you kids. When you accuse somebody of doing something that they didn't do and you get mad about it without finding out if they actually did it. Number one relationship to them right there. Men accusing their woman of cheating on them. And they get so mad. You, you know you were cheating on me. She was with the sisters at the church. You know what I'm saying? 
You, you know you was with no, no. That's why we say don't go any place where you could you're you're good to be evil spoken of. Right. Today, one of my former students wanted me to go out to lunch with her and the other female culinary teacher. I was like, no, thank you. How would that look? Pastors out to eat with a college female and a married woman. Not nah, look good. That's why I didn't go. It doesn't look good. No. Would I be doing anything with them? No. I'm old enough to be one of them's dad and one's granddad. But it doesn't look right. You can't put yourself in those situations. When it is disproportionate to the offense committed. Did I get more angry than the cost of those blinds? Probably. Probably. When it is directed against the innocent party rather than the guilty. Those two dogs are guilty. I'm not, they are the only ones that shoot them blind. When it's directed against the inno innocent party rather than the guilty. That happens. That happens. You can look at the anger in this country. Let's, let's even go back to the George, George Floyd thing, right? Instead of them being angry with that cop that was totally at the wrong, they got angry at every white person in America. I couldn't even try to defend black people during that time frame because they were all on me. My wife had to tell somebody she was disrespectful and remind her, look, I, he's a pastor and a man of God. You need to watch what you say. That's what the enemy wants. I was as mad as they were about taking that man's life like that. That's just, that was just wrong. On, a, on any level, it's wrong. But see, anger can be often directed to innocent parties. Some dictionaries point out that the old English word anger originally meant to choke or strangle. Sometimes this is what we would like to do to someone else because of our anger, right? Some of you have done that before. I'm not calling no names. However, we need to remember, this is what anger does to us. On one hand, it releases a rush of adrenaline, makes you feel powerful, and temporarily overwhelm pain. But on the other hand, unresolved anger can literally strangle you on the inside. Many studies have shown that consistently angry men are vulnerable to, ready for this, ulcers, high blood pressure, heart attack, colitis, arthritis, kidney stones, gallbladder trouble, and over 50 illnesses. There are also susceptible to psychological problems like substance abuse and aggressive and abusive behavior. Why well, I think there's a lot of alcoholics. Alcohols are downer. They can't control their anger. And then they get, they get crazy when they're drunk. And they do stupid stuff. When their anger is expressed through words and behaviors, rep it is repressed through denial and inter inter internal, um, internalizing. But it's still damaging. Depression is defined as anger turned inward. A lot of people are depressed these days, right? Anger turned inward. Eventually it blows up. Anger annihilates normal human responses. And the physical damage caused by anger only exceeded by spiritual harm it causes Unrestrained anger is sin. <laughs> Psalms 37 and 8. Cease from anger, forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Proverbs 25 and 28. He that hath no rule over his spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Proverbs 16 and 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. Colossians 3 and 8. But now ye also put off all these, th all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Are you ready for this? Filthy communication out of your mouth. That's another whole Bible study in and of itself. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be ye kind one to another. Siblings, be ye kind one to another. I told it to my kids. I'll tell it to my grandkids. I tell it to my school kids. I'll tell it to my church kids. 
Be kind one to another. Why, Pastor? Because the Bible said so. And as you kids say, period. If you don't say it, it ain't cool. <laughs> I'm kidding. James 1, 19 through 20. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Listen, guys, if you will be swift to hear and slow to speak, yeah, I am guarantee you to save you a lot of trouble. I was the opposite, right? Swift to speak, spit out what I thought, and then go, oh, well, I didn't hear that right. Or, oh, I didn't mean to say that. Because I wasn't swift to hear and slow to speak. I was swift to speak and slow to hear. Don't get them backwards, okay? Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, okay? Two principles, men. Anger is always the second emotion in any experience. The challenge is to recognize the first emotion that is causing the problem and express that rather than express anger. Nobody can make you angry. You have the power to choose to be angry or not. And what to do with your feelings in situations. Moms, that goes for you too. Because you moms know how angry you get at your kids. You choose to get mad over that dirt on the floor. You choose to scream and holler and fuss about them messing up the house. It's not usually the first time. It, it, it works up to that. Right, because you've been bottling it up. Ours, not, ours is that's because y'all know better. From my little household, <laughs> from our household, it is I come told you 20 times to stop doing that. About the 20th time I'm yelling. And Barb, how long did it take you to get your boys trained? <laughs> well, one of them still ain't trained. <laughs> Joe's trained. Let's see if he takes his shoes off when he goes to the house. Let's not let's not launder anybody's dirty laundry in church, okay? Let's leave the laundry at home. Yes, guys, you got to put your clothes in the hamper. My wife embarrassed me one time. I left my underwear on the floor. She set them on the back of the toilet seat. No, no, no. It was not on the floor. It was on the back of the toilet seat. I left them on the back of the toilet seat. And we had a lady from the church come over, and she used that bathroom. <laughs> we only had one bathroom. No, we had the two. Two toilets right next to each other. No, 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 there was that no. wall in between. No, no, no. That was on the base. That was on the military base. Was it on the base? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was on the Zaya Drive. Can I get my certificate of completion yet? Has it completed the course? I'm about 95% done. My clothes go in the hamper, thank you very much. I hang my towel up, boys. Hang your towel up, doggone it. Put your, put your underwear in the dirty clothes. Put all the clothes in the dirty clothes, unless they're wet. If they're wet, don't put them in the dirty clothes. Because then mama will really go off on them. Don't put the colors in the whites and the whites in this. And this and that. There's so many different baskets that James brought the colors. Don't do not go to clothes. See, guys, we have an anger problem. But we can cause other people to be angry at us over simple stuff that we don't think has any relevance. Over simple things that we think has no relevance. I said it twice. That's enough. One more time. People will be back. Simple things that we think have no relevance, have relevance to somebody else. Once again, nobody can make you angry. You have the power to choose to get mad about them underwear. Okay? Is this being taped? Glory be to Jesus. We're talking about holiness. This is what one man wrote about his struggle with anger. I was blind. I once was blind, but now I see. I see that I wrongly put all the blame for difficulties in our marriage on my wife. I see that the real problems were in me, not in her. I see that because of the deep hurts within me, I manipulated her to continually fill the bottomless pit of my need. I see that I almost destroyed 
the spontaneity and personality of my wife by my moods and critical spirit. I see that I put the same pressures on my children as they were growing up that my parents put on me. I see that my whole family had to dance around my emotions, never sure of how I would react. I see why I took those unhealthy risks in business, many of which I had spent years paying for. I see why I was never able to listen to others' advice, always thinking I knew better. Now I understand why some people were afraid of me, why I have made so many poor choices in life, and why I had never known real happiness. Anger is not worth it, and it is not holy. The last area. Hey, 8.30. I'm going long tonight, boy. Sorry, school's almost over anyway. It is well known that men are reasoners while women are feelers. Studies have shown in the brain that women perceive things differently than men. In general, men tend to be left brain while women tend to be right brain. What does that thing mean? Uh, the word most descriptive of left brain is think, while the right brain is feel. For instance, when a husband and wife make a decision, she may decide largely by intuition, a right brain process. The husband may be slower in deciding because he uses logic, the left brain in most cases. Uh, our Western civilization is devoted to left brain education that the left sides of our brains grow slightly heavier than the right side during school years. Statistics show that almost all children rank high in creative and emotional expression before entering school. By the age of seven, only 10% children rank high in expression. By the time adulthood is reached, only 2% of the population rank high in expression. There are, uh, there certainly appears to be some correlation between our idealization of logic and the death of expression. And for this, males in particular pay a heavy price due to their left brain tendency. Men tend to be thinkers first and feelers second. However, Christian men must realize that their natural tendencies toward logic and skepticism and critical thinking, which serve them well in the business world, are not foundational principles in God's kingdom. <clears throat> what? Really? Hebrews 11 and 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Listen, faith isn't a logical thing. Guys have a hard time with lo things that aren't logical. Faith is not logical. For him that cometh to God must, must believe that he is, and that he is the reward of them that diligently seek him. Mark 10 and 15. Verily I say to you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter in. Men tend to be the ones who reason themselves out of prayer, out of worship, out of salvation, because it isn't logical. Their cynicism becomes their own worst enemy in their relationship with God. And it's factual. It's harder to get a guy to come to church than it is to get a girl. Paul ties a man's willingness to overcome his predominantly male trait to a man's personal holiness. He says, men are to pray everywhere without doubting. In other words, their faith should be on display publicly. Just as women take the lead in matters external holiness, men must take the lead in like manner also in matters of internal holiness. Yet, we've seen that role reversed and in many, many times. Where the wife is the only one serving God, or she serves as the prayer warrior for the home, or she's the one who participates the most in worship, or she's the one who is the most exuberant wit witness for the Lord. It's time for men to assume their rightful leadership in prayer and in worship. Guys, it's time we stop letting the women out-worship us. Let's, let's dig into that competitive thing a little bit. We don't need to be out-worshipped by the ladies. God hasn't done more for the ladies than he's done for the men. He has done the same for both. He suffered and died for both. But the women seem to be more appreciative of God suffering and dying than we men do sometimes. Young boys, you need to begin to worship God. Jesus and not worry of what other people see or think. It's time for men to take their rightful place of leadership in prayer, worship, and witness and living for God. Just as it is God's will for Christian women to stand out in matters of modesty, it is God's will for Christian men to stand out in the ways of worship. Holiness is quite often backward in our culture. But God still desires us to be holy. 
Our men should be distinct in their action, as our women should be distinct in their appearance. Men, if you've not been holy before God, as you should have, if you've lost the struggle with appetite, anger, apathy, it's time to stand up and stand out for the Lord. I'm going to close with this last scripture. Micah 7 and 8. Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. And when I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. That scripture didn't say you're never going to fail. But it did say when I fall, I shall arise. When you do get angry, fix it. If you do lust after something, fix it. Get up. Don't let the enemy throw apathy on you and say, well, you messed up one time. God ain't never going to let you speak in tongues again. You ain't never going to be the preacher you used to be. You ain't never going to be the singer you used to be. Don't let the devil put apathy on you. And single guys, women don't want an apathetic man. They don't. They don't. They don't want it. And if you're waiting for God to send you a godly woman, maybe he's waiting for you to worship like a godly man. Maybe it's time for you to show God that you really love him with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then God will take care of the other things. He knows what it's like to be a man. He, he created us. And we need to be leaders in all things. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's stand and have a word of prayer.